Yo, what's up everyone? Welcome back, Jamie here with Nathan, and today we're going to be talking about Victor Crowler, aka Hatchet 4, which was released in 2017, three years after Hatchet 3, but it takes place 10 years after the events of the first three films. It's really yeah, good. It's really watch good. It. Very good, very good. Which is rare for a fourth film inside a, fran a horror franchise, what can you know? Yeah, especially considering the other three were all hitters. Just jump right in. It starts off in 1964, doesn't it? Which, I don't know necessarily why, it's 1964 like does that play any part i don't think it does to do I, I think it just shows like he's been doing it a while yeah and we've got a guy and a girl aren't we on a boat and he wants to propose to one <laughs> she starts crying and fucking snot and everything and it's just a mess and it's oh my god it's grim man it's fucking grim <laughs> It is grim it's worse than the kills i think for me anyway <laughs> it was as bad as the porridge scene <laughs> honestly i was dry heaving i i don't i don't like it i don't like it of course victor comes and kills him for the guy he puts the hatchet through his eye don't he? and it's it's like a 3d effect the eye just comes out nice kill just straight away is dead no suffering done and she falls on the floor and just starts hacking away at her leg first and then the arms after that, isn't it? We're now going to call that the Nika treatment, by the way. The Nika treatment, yeah. If you're not seeing Chucky, you don't know what we're talking about. <laughs> it was horrid. She she felt all of that. Every limb was gone. And then from there, we get a narration by a little girl just telling us basically the backstory of Victor, really. I always like hearing it. Like It's like, what, the third time we've heard it now? Yeah. But but his story's always nice to hear for some reason. Like, well, always... like you pointed out, what did she say? You know, like the kids were just like, yeah. you know. They just they just wanted to scare him, but it's like, you don't scare someone by mm. setting their house on fire. That just doesn't seem like something you do. Nah, that's that more might, scaring. It might just be me. I don't know. So then we cut to present, well, present day when this film came out, which is 2017. And Andrew, the guy from the last film who survived, is uh, he's sort of like a celebrity, I guess, and he's on a talk show because he's got a book coming out about the events. But most people think he, like, they don't believe in Victor Crowley. They think he's the murderer. <laughs> you can't really blame him. Like, if you put two and two together, you're going to probably get that answer if you're logically thinking. True. Sure. But what do you think happened? Like, we you know, obviously, spoiler alert, we see Mary Beth at the end, but, like, what do you think happened after the event? She just like went away into hiding or some shit. Because we see Andrew wrote a book and shit, but do you think she just went like, you know, because she could have backed up the story, couldn't she? Of like, oh yeah, I was there too, and you know, Victor's real. She probably wanted like out of that. She probably like had the gun gone to Andrew's head, like, no one knows about me ever. <laughs> like, I guess, yeah. Because it was a traumatic experience for her. Like, she lost a load of people, parents, uncle, all that stuff. Like, she wants now to do with that. So we've got our new cast of the characters who's basically like it's a girl director and I guess a boyfriend in it. And uh their friend played by Laura Rotti, so of Hills of Eyes and Holliston. Her name's Rose in this though. But basically they're making a film about the events of Hatchet, aren't they? It was decent. It was a different set of characters, but I enjoyed it. It's not just, you know, oh, we're going on a swamp tour or whatever. Yeah. Like it was characters with a goal instead of like the ones where it wasn't really a goal, like they had a reason to be there properly. So Andrew and his publicist, Felissa Rose, the girl out of Sleepaway Camp, they, um, she decides, she's got an interview for him and she and the person's like, I don't care how much money it is, he starts walking away and she's like, it's a million. <laughs> they just fades from him, closes his eyes and open him while he's on a plane. It's like, oh, yeah. Andrew, you're a slave to money. <laughs> but you should have guessed that. Like, no, he's going to pay a million dollars for an interview. Like, what the fuck? We get a cameo by uh, Adam Green and Joe Lynch. They're the pilots on the plane. So, you know, because Adam Green was in the other three, but obviously he couldn't play the same character 10 years later. Like, what? He just went from an alcoholic to a pilot. <laughs> you could do. You don't know his recovery story. I guess. Like, I think it's a different character, though. But, you know, they got the cameo in, which is good. The filmmakers arrive inside the swamp, don't they? Because they're making the trailer there and he have got an actual actor his name's dylan but he's the guy out of scary movie and all that and he, he steals the show here man he really does he was one of in two of the best characters was rose and his character dylan they were just mm. so enjoyable like dylan's character was meant to be a dumb idiot but he wasn't irritating he was an enjoyable yeah. dumb idiot like no you were rooting for him and he's like playing all different roles and shit and, and he's just like there's so many i'm not even gonna call most of the lines because it's just funny <laughs> what is it they get the uh there's a curse and they have crawler and like yeah. people have been doing it on youtube and she's like oh yeah get it up so you say it right for the film and then that's basically what causes victor to come back really <laughs> But while they do that, it, at the same time, it causes the planes to crash, doesn't it? Because they're filming their trailer, they're trying to get there to film the thing. It's just 
the stars align a little too perfectly for yeah. him. They put the phone down, don't they? And we get a little cameo of Reverend Zombie Tony Todd, which he filmed. 2002 was the date on it, so obviously it's before the events. But oh, that was cool as well to get him in there. Oh, yeah. Got cool to throw back to good old zombie. The swamp has turned into like a tourist attraction now. I wanted to do like tours through it. So they got like set up lights that keep going on and off. And they play with this very well because the two of them are inside like the uh, weapon shed, aren't they? And it's just like. No one's here. No, no one could possibly hear. Light comes on, empty space. See, there's nothing there. And then, as the light comes on, Victor's already in mid sprint, and it's <laughs> actually a decentish jump scare. Yeah, because the guy's like halfway through his sentence, and Victor just jumps yeah. in. <laughs> See, there's nobody even. Th- and it's but he just gets the hammer and he goes to town on that guy's eyes. Holy shit! <laughs> like he's alive. Like he is still alive, but his eyes sockets have been caved in, so it's literally like a dip where his eyes should have been. Mm. And then he just decides to spin the arrow around and just pop his head off like a cock. <laughs> and the amount of blood they used for this single kill was a, a devious amount. The rest of the characters are hiding inside the plane, aren't they? Because it can only can open from the is it inside. Yeah. From the inside, yeah. So they're all hiding in there, but one of them, who, well, we haven't really mentioned, you know, there's like the interview is on the plane, and she's got like what, like a makeup person and like sound and all that, mm-hmm. and two of them together aren't in one of them's pregnant, yeah, and she's stuck underneath the chair while the water's rising. <laughs> Although I don't know how she got stuck underneath the chair because it's literally just one scene she's not, and the next scene she's stuck. But mm. if my memory of how basic things work, realistically. You don't need to lift it up. You just need to be able to lift it up, give it a little, just enough of a ledgeway for it to slide out. I fully believe she could have escaped that. I've never got a clear shot either because we were questioning, weren't we? Like, what is it that's. Oh. And then she eventually says it's a chair. Yeah. All, she ever, all you ever see is her net down going, I'm stuck underneath the chair. Chloe, the director of the film, obviously her boyfriend got killed with a hopper. She arrives at the plane, doesn't she? And you get a sick shot because obviously she can't hear because of the window. So she's walking towards the door and Vix is just slowly behind her. Oh, I, I fucking love that. <laughs> so good. Chef's kiss. And he smashes her head through the window and he drags her into like the moonlight to use her as bait, basically. Mm-hmm. Which, oh my, it just, he's smart, Victor. He's not just some, you know, hulking fucking guy, you know. Out of all the Victor Crowley things, uh, Victor Crowley movies, The Hatchets, this is probably where he looks the most evil. I don't mean that in a visual aspect, because to me, number three, that's when visually he looked the most evil. But the way that he does things and the way his movement, the way he'll stare, he acts the most evil in this one. Like, yeah. it sets across of, it's not, not a man, it's a monster. So Crawl is waiting on top of the plane, which is really good as well. He's just stood on top of it, and the publicist runs out to try and get a phone connection. And this kill right here, holy shit. He drags her arm off. And <laughs> it's time for a fisting. <laughs> From the bottom all the way through to her mouth with the phone still inside her hand. The girl who's using his bait just literally stomps her head in while fucking Rose watches. It's the perfect stomp as well. Like, he does it so the bottom draw's fine, but all this bit is gone. One thing that I will point out that I still think is funny is going back to the um, arm through the whole body kill. It has them all react to it, but when you get to Rose, she just throws up on the window. (laughs) (laughs) And then we get as kind of a sad death, like you said, and the girl drowns, doesn't she? Every kill in the Hatchet films always feels like aggressive hyper-violence, because... It's just over there just going ape shit. But the girl dies because the plane is at an angle, it's slowly submerging. And she is forced under the chair and she's just slowly dying because obviously she's drowning. And you don't hear her going bubble bubble. What you actually hear during this step is Dylan's got holding a hand and he's screaming because he's feeling her grass get tired. She realizes she's dying. And from a film that's usually full of haha funny go, this is quite a sad kill and it's really some of. Mm-hmm. It's done really well. Better than most deaths in other films. True. I think the characters are definitely the strongest like, yeah. inside the series, aren't they? Definitely. Yeah. Definitely the strongest. And we get a, you know, to lighten the mood, we get some funny interaction between them on the plane, don't we? When the like, <laughs> keeps ringing us like, what if he just comes back every 10 years? <laughs> he doesn't. <laughs> but what if he comes back every... Have you got a different idea that's still not dumb? <laughs> <laughs> Again, we said it before, Dylan is a star in this show. Mm-hmm. And then, um, what is it? From the weapon shed, there's the belt sander in there, and, and Rose is like, I hope no one left the belt sander lying about, and then Victor just brings it to get through the door. <laughs> <laughs> belt sander is such 
a good weapon in this thing. Again, I'm happy they call it Hatchet and not Belt Sander, but I love that weapon in this film. He, he gets so much use out of it and the kills are always great. But then one has the plan to turn on the engine, doesn't it, to kill Crowler, so he goes into the cockpit. <laughs> I just remembered I am writing this bit down, but did one of the bodies falls and done <laughs> he's like, no, like, no, not now. <laughs> it looks like it's like like not uh or ah, but it's like no, not now. Like wait, so you gonna come back at some point and kiss it, Dylan? <laughs> he steals the show. He's such a good character, man. The rest of the characters get out of the plane, don't they? And Rose hides behind inside a tree up above. But I, I love like it's just well, it's not a tear, is it a tear or a sweat? It's anything. Something drops down from the tree, and Crowley hears just the drop her, and he just throws the hatchet straight away. And we got Dylan King trying to. Get He's in the cockpit and he just keeps changing his title. He's like, this is General Dylan. We need help. We're under siege for Victor Crowley. Oh, what? what is it? What is it? This is First Marshal Dylan the second. <laughs> we are we are under fire from Victor Crowley. So And then we get a Kane Hodder cameo on the voice, then he's, he's like, This is a private station, don't use it or some shit like that. Hello? And then this is like it ends pretty quick to be fair, this finale bit, doesn't it? Because Basically, the engine comes on, Dylan gets it on. The rest of the, well, the people left is basically Rose, Dylan, and Andrew. They're the three characters left at this point. Funny interaction, though. He stood there against the engine. All three of them are lined up. Rose comes in. No, I've got this. <laughs> Throws an axe, lands 10 feet away from him. Okay, Andrew, you've got this. With a flare gun, says a one-liner, shoots all the way over his head. Dylan respectfully just goes, anything else? <laughs> Any more one-liners? <laughs> and what does he say? He goes to Rose, he's like, uh, I would have had your babies, and he poops on her nose, and he just runs straight after Victor, and you both go through the engine. <laughs> it was actually really emotional, because you've, as much as Andrew was in this film, he wasn't particularly that great. But Rose and Dylan, you were like kind of rooting for, because they were really mm. enjoyable characters, especially the interactions they had. And then it just basically ends with the blood splatter on them both, and Andrew goes, fuck, and then we cut to black, per usual. <laughs> but of course, there's an after credit scene, about a minute or two into it, we see a news report of uh, Andrew and Rose like coming out of the swamp, and it slowly uh, backs out, and it's Daniel, it's Barry Beth, Daniel Harris, fucking gets the shotgun, and she's like, what? I've been waiting for you, motherfucker. This film was a godsend. Everything about it was perfect. I went into watching these reviews thinking number three was my favourite, but I'm going to have to redo it and say Victor Crowell's my favourite, so it's getting a 10 out of 10 from me, man. Mm, 9 out of 10 from me as well, which like, the only complaint I'd say is Mary Beth in it, but you've replaced them with good characters as well. I just wish Dylan would have survived. <laughs> Unless they bring him back and he's got a brother or some shit. I mean, they could just do that. <laughs> That'd be perfect. That would be amazing. <laughs> yeah, I, I hope Adam Green does another one, Hatchet 5. And, you know, you bring back Rose, Mary Beth, Andrew, like we discussed last night, you could kill him off, maybe, I guess. Kill him off, because I like Rose more than I like Andrew. True. Sure. But yeah, this is definitely the best of the series, no doubt. Yeah. But let us know your thoughts and opinions down below. Make sure you like and subscribe if you're new. Check out Nathan's social links as well. Until, well, this is it for now. Until Hatchet 5 one day <laughs> in a bit.